Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, our Facebook viewers and uh, NMH's loyal supporters. My name is Ogito Greg, and you are here with me at the Namibian National COVID Communication Center. It's uh, Saturday morning, the 18th of April, 2020, and we are right at the start of the extension of the national lockdown today. We are expecting the Minister of Justice, Yvonne Dauseb, Honorable, and uh, the Attorney General Advocate Festus Mbandeka to come and talk to us about the legality of the national lockdown down and it's enabling regulation. I think it's going to be a very interesting session today and it's important that all Namibians stay up to date and inform themselves so that we can cope with this crisis brought on by the arrival of the COVID-19 virus to our shores and get through it together. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Dr. Honorable Kanji. Yes, there was a question that I would like to respond to, mm -hmm. and this is the question that uh, dealt with uh, whether we collaborate with the Ministry of Basic Education uh, on issues pertaining to, uh, to e-learning. I think we all know that education is a continuum, mm -hmm. and therefore, if there are challenges at the lower part, obviously, uh, a higher education will not be well grounded. So indeed, there is continuous uh, engagement, discussions, even now, uh, dealing with uh, the aspects of e-learning, dealing with uh, the possibility even come next year, should uh, COVID uh, uh, be a protracted challenge, will we be able to have first years or, or no? Those are the things that we are already engaging on, uh, including actually how best we ca they can be capacitated so that uh, if indeed uh, they have the right infrastructure, they will be able to to roll out uh, the e-learning at that level. Uh, with regard to the final words, I would like to say that um, uh, the ministry is here to put out policies. Uh, the ministry is also here to ensure that it facilitates uh, partnerships, it facilitates engagements that lead to strong partnerships between and amongst institutions and organizations to ensure that at the end of the day, uh, quality higher education uh, is actually achieved at our institutions. But the actual action has to be done by the institutions. For example, forging partnerships with telecommunication uh, companies to ensure that some of the gadgets that we are talking about, that students are lacking, this could be ironed out with uh, MOUs with some of these companies. And I believe since the discussions have started, we'll be in a better position to ensure that some of those things are taken care of. I would also like to urge students out there and parents out there to ensure that we encourage our students, our youth, our learners who can access e-learning to actually do so jealously. It's important for them to guard the journey. moderate this discussion, very important discussions. As we all know, that uh, as of today, the whole country is in a national lockdown. And for that reason, uh, the amendments that was proclaimed under the, the emergency has been amended. And for that reason, this session uh, will essentially deal with uh, elaborating much more and explaining to the nation what those amendments and repeal of some of those regulations entail. But before we do that, we would, as customary, uh, start by giving an update on the health situation as, as it pertains to the COVID-19 pandemic. And to do this, we would ask the Honorable Minister of, of Health uh, to give us an update. Comrade Minister. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, moderator. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, good morning. I, I'm happy today to make very, very short two announcements or update. Um, number one, we have now so far recovered uh, six persons altogether 
who were diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. Uh, in our language, what we always speak here, that will be case number three, case number five, case number six, case number 14, case number 15, and case number 16. All of these four cases have now fully recovered uh, from uh, COVID-19. Some of them have already been announced before, but I'm just giving you now the totality of the picture. Number two, we are going to carry out targeted testing. As I have uh, informed you earlier, targeted testing, um, we are looking at different type of cohorts. Um, this will include the health workers, um, people who are working in the fishing factories, in the fishing sector, in the mining sector. This will also include the journalists. Uh, so by next week, uh, we will um, try to get everybody who is also at this center will also be uh, tested. The test is very simple. It's non-invasive. It's just a swab which is taken from an individual. You will not feel anything, so don't fear anything. It's, it's harmless, and in actual fact, it is also pleasant to undergo such a uh, swabbing. We will again um, identify more and more a group of people who will be uh, tested, and uh, our target is to get more than 200,000 people tested uh, in Namibia for uh, COVID-19. This will also include the categories I have mentioned earlier in the past, like those who have been in contact, those who are presenting to the health facility with respiratory ailment, etc., etc. So this is now one of the undertakings which are going to carry out as from next week. We are now doing the preparations. Uh, dear moderator, I think uh, after I have made this announcement, I will take leave because I just came from another engagement. But the team from the Ministry of Health and Social Services, they are here, they remain here, and they will be able to answer the question should there be any additional question arising. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Minister. Maybe I must also just clarify that today we've got an extended uh, session. Uh, it is going to be extended with a, an extra 30 minutes. So the first part, as we said, is dealing with the health situation. And then towards at the end of everything, we would be having a question and answer session. So, Comrade Minister, you are more than welcome to leave us because we know that you must attend to other things. Thank you very much for your input. And then um, we will now be having um, Ms. Linikela Kalimba and Ms. Emi Els Ndaveteta. Excuse me for that. And sorry if I'm not saying it correctly. Uh, they are going to give us an, an update on the surveillance from the surveillance pillar as well as from the call center but we are first going to call on uh miss emmy good morning good morning emmy else in the vitella not the vitella okay thank you very much <laughs> my name. sorry for that <laughs> i'm heading the surveillance pillar uh, good morning. Uh, maybe to start with defining what is surveillance, because uh, we had been talking about surveillance, surveillance, but probably some people don't know what is really encompassed when we are talking of surveillance. Surveillance is mainly information-based activity, which involves the collection, the analysis, interpretation, 
and dissemination of the data for action. We underscore for action, because when you are doing surveillance, it's just not a mere activity of collecting data, but there must be a meaning or a purpose why you are collecting that data. You need to take action. That's very important. So the surveillance data is used to evaluate the effectiveness of control and, in, in, and preventive of health measures. Now, in terms of COVID-19, this is the guide, the guiding pillar, how we need to act, how do we need to prevent or to apply our control measures that is directed by surveillance. And for it to be effective, it needs to be standardized across all levels. What we do at national level should be done the same at regional level, district level, and up down to the community level. In this COVID-19 response, we are applying the guideline of WHO following the pillars, and we have also subgroups uh, under surveillance. Because it's a very big activity, so we, for us to be effective, we need to split it in smaller portions. So we have a contact tracing, which is mainly responsible for identifying contacts when we have a confirmed case. Then we identify all the possible contacts of all the people who came uh, into contact with this person who is confirmed so that we monitor them. We monitor them for the 14 days, specifically in the case of COVID because each disease is having its own uh, dimension. So because of the incubation period of COVID, which is 14 days, that's why we monitor contacts for 14 days. Then we have the hotline is also part of surveillance because it serves as an event-based surveillance. It's very important to know that the purpose of the hotline is to give the opportunity to the public when you don't know information or you want to be aware of COVID-19, of course, you call the call center. But if you are also worried or might be you are aware of one person who might be presenting with COVID-19 symptoms, that's what we call event-based surveillance, where we get information, then we investigate that information. We have the laboratory coordination. Of course, uh, with any outbreak response, you cannot do much without laboratory. So laboratory coordination is the link between the laboratory services and the surveillance. Because we need to follow up when we uh, investigate the case, we need to have the results timely. So that's why we need this link between the two areas. Then we have the rapid response teams, which we deploy or dispatch immediately to the field when there is any issue to be investigated. And these are also the people which are doing uh, uh, investigate in this case, swabbing at home or uh, at facilities. Just to mention the few, because uh, we are having about uh, seven sub pillar under surveillance. What we are doing is also, it's, our, it's a surveillance responsibility also to inform or to update the nation, what we call a situational report. We update the situational report on a daily basis. We get information from all other pillars, then we put it in the report, which is shared. This report, when it's scrutinized, validated, and verified within the response teams and by the executives in the ministry, then it's become a public, it comes into public domain. So everyone has the right to access that situational report. So basically, that's what we do in surveillance. I welcome questions, if any, because I know I have limited time. Right. No, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, what we will do, as we said, at the end of all the inputs, the, there would be a time for question and answer. And in fact, that we will be opening the questions to the general public. So we won't be, quest we won't be posing questions to you now, but you must be on standby for the questions to be posed later. We will now ask uh, Ms. Linikela Kalimba from the, from the call center to give us an update. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ma'am. I'm from the COVID-19 hotline center, and it is uh, really a hotline. 
This COVID-19 call center is an initiative of the Ministry of Health and, and Social Services. The ministry started this uh, center during the outbreak of the hepatitis E, and uh, it was declared as a public health emergency operation center, which is mandated to deal with diseases outbreaks in the country. The center has various teams, and the hotline center is just one of them. The call center has, uh, was functioned on a smaller scale, and um, it's, a, it's just a component of uh, put in place to assist the fight against hepatitis E and other future disease outbreaks. When the first um, COVID-19 case was registered in the country, a decision was made for the center to be fully functional and to operate on a larger scale and to, to connect the community at, at large with the healthcare providers across the country. We now known as a hotline call center and we started operating from the 14th of March 2020 on a full scale. It operates 24-7 and with a staff complement, with a staff of uh, 35 people. Most of them local Namibian languages are represented by each shift and the staff are divided in three shifts which is either a 12 hour uh, shift or a six hour shift or a night duty as i said we are operating 24 hours we have various categories of healthcare workers represented as we have lots of graduates the nurses doctors who are doing their internship public health practitioners, epidemiologists, as well as health information system graduated on board. Some of them are volunteers, most of them are volunteers. And the main responsibilities of the call center is to answer calls as they are coming in. We respond to questions, receive complaints and concerns from the public and channel them further. We give advice on and refer them to the relevant people and officers because we receive calls from all the regions in the country. At the same time, we are also conducting research and preserve data collected for the future use. Um, this hotline is a, really a very important link between the community and the Minister of Health and Social Services. And I'm very happy to report that the, now the whole country is really in a, a accepting situation because the first uh, week during the, the lockdown, the country was in a panic mode and we were receiving between 15 up to 25,000 calls per day, just inbound calls. And we try all our best to answer the calls, even though we are at the receiving end of the Namibian emotions, because people call with various issues. We have also received um, calls from our president. Time to time, he calls to, just to encourage us and praise our work that we do. And because he said he's very grateful for that. The call center is run by a committed team and not by individuals, although sometimes one become overwhelmed when calls are so many. Our team is very, is really very committed and together we are running it effectively. And that makes us feel very important and valued indeed. And uh, because of the too many calls, sometimes we need our these graduates, young graduates, just to be debriefed by the social workers and psychologists and because sometimes it becomes hectic. Sometimes we also get uh, visits from other people who are like the First Lady, the Vice President, His Excellency Nangolo Mumba, our Deputy Prime Minister, Ms. 
Mrs. Uh, Netumbon Nanjindaitwa, our minister, uh, Dr. Shangula sometimes also come, the governor, Ms. Laura McLeod Kashira, and some business people. They all paid visit just to encourage us and to check on our resources if we are really doing well. COVID-related issues, calls received and query registered range from COVID-related issues to non-COVID-related issues. COVID-related issues are like wanting to know the signs and symptoms of the disease, how to prevent the, uh, the disease, where they can go for testing, or people having signs and symptoms of flu, health, and also we also receive uh, calls from the health care workers who are at the situation, having a situation at hand, like both from private and uh, public. Uh, we're also giving health education on the spot and also makes use of the opportunity to stress the importance of social distancing and hand hygiene, as well as other important measures and individual needs. Some callers calls to ask about circulating SMSs that they are receiving from, from, uh, from WhatsApp or social medias. And you know, we really receive lots of um, those uh, questions. So I'm discouraging everybody not to, um, maybe to forward this false or fake news. Because when you send it to other people, then we are there to clarify. And then, you know, some callers which are may maybe having unrelated issues are like they're asking about the grants or they don't have water, labor-related issues, lockdown guidelines, the nowadays the zones, the permits to function as essential services, traditional doctors who are informing us that they found a cure and they want to test it on the patients, School children and parents wanting to know when school is starting. Tenants unable to pay their rents and due to the lockdown. Domestic disputes. Some callers are just calling to chat because they are bored at home or they don't know what to do with themselves. Some people are calling because they send the wrong e-wallets to the wrong numbers. Some callers are just calling to put us on on place and because they think we are doing nonsense. All calls are very important to us and we treat them as such. Sometimes when, they, when we can assist at that moment, we will call back and advise them accordingly. We receive call from all callers from outside Ventuk when they need medical attention or, or when they are reporting that they are having signs and symptoms of COVID-19 or they come in contact, or they have came in, into contact with a person with uh, and symptoms of COVID-19, or they came into contact with a tested positive, and we refer them to the surveillance teams, or wherever they are, because we have got uh, surveillance in each region. Remember that uh, the work of the call center is only to advise and connect the callers to the other surveillance teams or to the right officers. That is where our mandate ends. Because now we spend too much time answering the totally irrelevant issues sometimes, we want to, and we only want to focus on health issues. And so I'm urging um, maybe the different sectors to come together and create both, I mean, sorry, both public and private to establish their hotlines. Even if just maybe managed by two people or three, and they don't need maybe to make uh, shifts like us, just maybe like a normal eight to five hours. Because this one will really take off some burdens from uh, our shoulders. Because, you know, when the cause is coming, we cannot ignore them. We have to assist where we can. 
But then, maybe behind that call, the call of the e-wallet, behind that call is a, a really sick patient or the, there's a doctor in a, at a consulting room who really needs to speak to us. And then now it's covered, I mean, it's uh, blocked because we are busy speaking to these people. And we only have got about 11 lines. And if each line, one line is talking about um, grants, one line is talking about e-wallets, one line is talking about water, line, one line is talking about boredom and all those things which I've fun I mean, I said earlier, then we are really blocked. We cannot uh, educate or speak about uh, uh, COVID-19. You know, these people, they can team up with uh, alike sectors and then um, man their own hotlines. That is my humble request, if it is possible. I have seen that the Minister of Finance has set up their own hotline. Maybe the Minister of Education, Minister of Trade and Industry, like Minister of Agriculture, maybe they can uh, team up together with the Agribank. All the banks together, they can put up their center, including DBN. So, and then it will be much better for us. So, and then we will focus on what we are mandated to do. At the end, or in conclusion, I must emphasize that we value each caller. We assist to the best of our abilities. We are at the call center because of our people. I should, however, also humbly ask our parents to teach the kids the importance of the call center. Because most of the time, we have got uh, small children, you can hear the mother talking behind and they are just playing with our phones. And you know we cannot ignore them. We have to finish, I mean to listen first because we don't know what situation is that child in. So we have to answer and yeah. Um, I must also use the opportunity to thank each and every agent at the call center for their hard work and determination, they really answer each call. There's no dull moment with us and they really work hard even though they are volunteers. And to our callers, keep calling us. If you just start with a headache or a cough or you are in doubt of about your health, please call us. And please stay at home and take care of your good of yourselves and we are here for you and for the people who are bored they can maybe start on maybe do your gardening uh, mend your clothes or Read. do other things inside your yard not in the street thank you very much thank you very much Lini Keller. what we will do now is we will allow five minutes to the media practitioners to ask questions specifically related to the health update before we would jump into the discussions of the amended regulations. So I would call upon um, media practitioners to please take the mic and to post the questions just specifically uh, related to the health update. You may go, sir. Thank you. My name is Kevin. I am a presenter on Eagle FM. Thank you for the opportunity. If I, if I am to indicate to you over that uh, line that I do have all the classical symptoms of COVID-19, what's the procedure after that? Am I supposed to get in a taxi? How, how, how do you take it from there, from the call center? Okay. Thank you. Second one. Uh, good morning, thank you. My name is Ogito Craig. I'm a journalist. I work for 
Republican newspaper, part of NMH Group. Uh, I'd like to know, in terms of the situation report that was mentioned, uh, which is in the public domain, how the public could access that uh, situation report, and then any additional information about the, uh, how the testing will proceed will be most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can I ask the colleagues, and not just Lini Keller and the first person that spoke, I was also informed that there are other people from the ministry that are also on standby to answer some of those specific questions. But please, uh, can we get a response to the first question? Um, what are the procedures if someone were to indicate that uh, he or she is having the symptoms? Uh, what are the procedures to be followed from the call center? Good morning. morning My name is Emma Helau. I'm the deputy head of the call center. If a call comes in and somebody is complaining of the signs of COVID-19, there are certain questions that we are asking. For example, now because the borders are closed, we can no more ask about traveling history. But traveling history was key in the past. We are going to ask that person if they have come into contact with a person that has either tested positive or is portraying signs of uh, COVID-19 and um, how, how many days is the person having the signs and the key ones is the person, for example, having fever, is a person having a headache and then we, depending on where the person is, we refer them to the relevant uh, authorities in Vinduk. We have uh, Robert Mugabe who's doing the testing. But before we refer the person to Robert Mugabe, we'll ask the person if they are having a public transport or they are using public transport, sorry, or they are having private uh, transport. Because if this person is complaining about the signs and symptoms of COVID, we do not want them to use public transport. So if they do not have public transport, we send our response team to go and do the screening or or if they have uh, private transport, we ask them to drive to Robert Mugabe. In the regions, we have um, surveillance team across all regions in the country. We connect with a person in the responsible in the specific uh, region, and then we give the number of that person that called um, for them to connect so that the person is followed up. Thank you. I hope I answered the question. Thank you very much. The second question related to the situation report that was, that was given. I need this. Okay, uh, on the question of uh, accessibility of the situation report, uh, we share this widely with uh, uh, stakeholders and we also give a copy to our public and relation office so that uh, it further circulates to all other people who can access it. And it's also uploaded on the ministry's website. Further to this, we are now busy with uh, uh, making it electronically. We are working on an electronic version dashboard of this trip with just a snapshot of the key indicators, which uh, I believe will be launched early next week then the link will be provided also to the public so that everybody who have means to access that then will be able to have that updated information with a fingerprint. Okay. Thank you very much. I must just add that if there are any other questions, those questions can be posed uh, towards the end. We have now come to the end of part one of this, of this session. And, but as I said, after the two speakers that would now be introduced and that would, that would now be giving their input towards that, towards the end of that, we would be having a general uh, question and answer session, first to the public and then thereafter again to the journalists. So I would ask journalists to please hold on to those questions. We've now come to the main reason why we are here. As we all know that um, as of Midnight, mid, is it midnight uh, this, early this morning, 
our country is officially under a national lockdown. Uh, the regulations that were promulgated in the first ones, regulations nine, had to be uh, amended. And in order to unpack the new uh, regulations, uh, we've got here with us the Honorable Minister, uh, Honorable Yvonne Dowsett, Minister of Justice, and she is assisted by the Attorney General, Mr. Festus uh, Pendeka, Pandeka, and they are going to unpack for us the meaning and the necessity of these uh, new um, regulations. I would start first generally, before we delve into the very specifics of the, of, of the regulations, uh, Yvonne. Mm -hmm. Would you mind if I say, Yvonne? Not a problem at all. Good, Good morning. Good morning, anyway. Um, first, the first question to, to the minister. What necessitated the amendment of the regulations? Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, let me start off by saying that the intention of amending the regulations was twofold. One, um, as you know, the president earlier this week had made an announcement that uh, we will extend the period of lockdown from 17 April, which was yesterday, uh, to the 4th of May. And uh, what we needed to do then is to first ensure that that amendment of the extension is reflected uh, in the regulations. The, the second reason, and I think for us maybe a more important one, is the fact that we wanted to maybe clarify some provisions of the regulations. Uh, in some instances, uh, modify, amplify, increase the content of the regulations, because you'd know the circumstances under which we had um, passed the, or promulgated the first set of regulations was quite tight, and they may not have been, um, we may not have thought through everything. So, so we wanted to make sure that if there were some things that are vacant, we're not saying the current regulations are, are perfect, and I'm very happy uh, since we've just started distributing the document that um, Namibians have taken the time to look through the text and, and started making comments on it. And I think that's the purpose of this interaction with our uh, Namibian public, is to ensure that, you know, when, once we've written something, um, it may, we may not have thought of everything, but that we give them an opportunity um, to comment, to criticize, uh, to constructively engage with the documentation. So that as time goes and, and as situations change um, and as the circumstances change, we, we allow the space to make the required amendments. So, so that really was. Okay. I do want to quickly say, John, okay. though, that we must remember that uh, lockdown is just one measure of our overall state of emergency. Okay, okay. I've got another follow-up question to you, Yvonne, and that would be in, in, in a summarized form without again going into the details, because we will do that later. What would you say are the major changes uh, between uh, Proclamation 9 and 13? The, the, I, think, I suppose the biggest change, apart from the fact that we've now um, extended the time, but we've also uh, extended the, the additional requirements uh, to the entire nation, what we've also now inserted. Remember, in the first regulations, we, only, we had an annexure that had only Thomas and Erongo. Now we have uh, divided the country into 10 zones, and, and that's another important aspect that has been um, included in, in these regulations. Something else, there's some, as we're going along, uh, you know, there were some uh, concerns that members of the public raised. What we've also done now uh, is we have, for example, opened up and relaxed some of the stringent conditions under which the Namibians were operating. So, for example, and I think for, for us an important uh, amendment is the fact that we opened up the, the space for informal trading and, and open markets. And I think that's, that's an important 
uh, change for us. We've also changed, made some changes around critical services. Uh, for instance, uh, we've added education as a critical service. It wasn't there previously. And we've opened up the provisions on educational materials, which is important because if we're talking about uh, closing schools um, and opening up the space for e-learning, it was important then for us to make provision in the regulations uh, for those kinds of arrangements because then it gives latitude to um, the, the state uh, under the governance of the Minister of Education uh, but also governing bodies of various schools, including private schools, I suppose, uh, to make the arrangements that they need to make uh, for us to continue the teaching and learning process uh, in Namibia. Okay. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, for the Attorney General, uh, last night when I went through the, through the regulations, the amended regulations, I must say that I like the tone of the regulations. What do I mean by that? The regulations written in plain language, um, it is almost, not almost, it is very much collaborative language that is used as opposed to coercive language. Can you explain to us and to the nation it's like, what was the rationale for drafting the specific regulations in such kind of language? Thank you, John, and uh, thanks to the listeners. Uh, John, as you are well aware that the whole process of lawmaking is, is quite a complex one, it's very technical. However, the main intention to make a law that is probably more understandable and user-friendly is to to strive to use a language that can be understood by the ordinary person. And sometimes, I think as lawyers, we get caught up into the technical language and the legalistic part of the, uh, the law. But since this part of legislation is meant to be used by the whole nation and by ordinary people, we have attempted to use a language that could be understood that could not cause a lot of confusion as we have seen that in the past there is always an issue in terms of interpretation as to what certain provisions of the law means and it is what is intended to to achieve so in this case even though i must admit that it's not a perfect piece of legislation or amendment however we have attempted to address some of the uh, the defects or deficiencies that exist in the previous one or in the earlier a proclamation. This is really the main aim to help the, uh, the users of this law and the, the members of the public to understand it better. But however, I need also to consider that it may not necessarily have addressed all the concerns that might have been raised. I know that there are a lot of areas that still require some perfection and we shall continue to work on some of those areas even by either amending where it's necessary or by explaining, you know, by explanation and uh, education, because we believe that uh, for Namibians to be able to really comply with this piece of legislation, they first and foremost need to understand what it meant and also to under appreciate the rationale behind some of this provision and also to appreciate the main objective why we are having the state of emergency in place and why certain measures and restrictions have been put in place. So that's really the main aim and uh, I just want to continue, uh, insist that since this is a very technical piece of, 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 of legislation, in a sense that it is addressing some of the issues that we have never experienced before, somehow, somewhere, we still need to educate our people, we still need to explain certain provisions, and I want to urge the nation to also indicate to us what else that we need to do to be able to make them understand so that they feel that they are able to comply without too many uh, doubts as to what some certain provisions may are meant. Thank you, Festus. And so for that reason, I'm going to ask you this follow-up question. Are there plans to, to translate the regulations into local languages? We have just heard from the lady that was speaking from the outline that uh, there are also people that are trying to to educate and to explain some of these things in the local vernaculars. What can we say this or can we expect the same in this regard? John, ideally I think we want to have this uh, legislation 
probably translate it in two different languages. But because of the uh, agency and because of the, uh, the time constraint that we have, what we have uh, discussed, at, I think at the uh, cabinet level, we have looked at various ways in which we can at least educate our people, also to explain the law to the nation. Uh, there are various aspects that uh, we are looking at. Uh, I think after, even after this interview, I shall be going to the to NBC Oshiwambo Radio to go and explain the law in Oshiwambo. And I, there is an also undertaking from various uh, institutions like our colleagues from MICT to see how best we can take that to other language stations so that we can explain this law to the nation. So we believe that in doing so, we shall be able to then achieve the main objective of this law. Okay. Thank you very much. And now we're going to deal with some specific things that I've picked up. And please, if some of the things that I'm asking you about is not on your or is some of the things that I'm having might be also on your list or some I might have left out, please feel free to also elaborate on this. But in order to have a, a, a structured discussion, I would want the minister to explain to us uh, the meaning between essential services and critical services that has been brought in uh, in, in this new regulation. Thank you very much, John. I think an important question. So remember, when you talk about essential services or critical services, um, the elements that you want to cover is does the disruption or interruption of that service, does it affect the health the safety um, of a particular nation. And remember, we have a state of emergency because we, we couldn't use our current setup of laws and institutions to respond to COVID-19. So I think people must always keep that at the back of their mind to say, why do we find ourselves in this situation? We're finding ourselves in this situation because like I always say, a state of emergency provides you with some flexibility to do the things that you need to do. And it also allows you to suspend uh, some common law provisions or statutes, but it also allows you to bring to life uh, uh, perhaps some, some procedures and rules that will help you facilitate the management, in this instance, a health crisis. So, so, so uh, when we talk about, so, so the Labor Act, um, 11 of, of 2007 actually has a very uh, structured list of essential services. It has also defined essential services and that's where I borrow the elements from. And so what we needed to do is we knew, um, uh, at least as cabinet, that that list would not have covered everyone. Uh, that would otherwise, under these circumstances, uh, needed to respond to how to manage and facilitate the, the, the dangers of, of COVID-19. And so what we did is we took that list that is provided for by the Labor Act, which really the objective is to address concerns that relates to, to, to labor matters. Um, and and, and it's in, in a way, it's restrictive. And we took what we thought was a broader umbrella, which is critical services, to include others that would otherwise not fit in that. And that's why we have a, a, a list. So, so the, the diff, there's no, there was, there's no, maybe the difference is nuanced, but, but technically it's really about wanting to amplify or augment or increase what was already provided for so that we were able to place a, a larger group um, of persons uh, that would otherwise not have fit. For, For example, example, cabinet members, yeah, yeah. Uh, members of parliament would not otherwise have fitted neatly into, into that list. And what about the informal traders? Uh, do they provide essential services or is it a critical service? So, so what we've done is we've listed what are essential goods, uh, which includes foodstuffs and so forth. You would have seen that in our annexure. And so informal traders that fit that provide that service, um, that prov supplies critical um, services or essential goods that relate to COVID-19 health and so forth, they would otherwise then be considered um, as, as critical service providers. And as such be allowed to continue. Yes, I mean the idea is that yeah. we open up that space and you know so that you you are able to now buy your tomatoes at the at the guy that sits at the corner in in the in the location for example whether you live in a in Mabashu or you live 
in, in, in whatever area you're living in, you don't have to now walk all the way to ShopRite or to Vuerman Brock um, to, to purchase your onions and your tomatoes. So in that sense, that gentleman at the corner of that street then becomes a critical service provider. Very good. And he provides essential goods. Thank you very much. You want to add? Yes, just to add something to what uh, the Honorable Minister just mentioned. In terms of the um, opening up, we have looked at various uh, economic activities that could be opened up without necessarily risking the lives of Namibians. And the uh, open market and the informal trading is, was one of those aspects. And notwithstanding that decision, there has been always an issue about how can we then manage that situation without necessarily exposing uh, members of the public to the risk of being contracted. <laughs> infected. So then the discussion took place between the relevant ministries and the Ministry of Health so to say that we shall go ahead, open up these areas, however we shall put certain health protocols in place to ensure that when that sector is opened up, people are managed in terms of uh, the regulations how to go there, how to conduct the activities there, those who shall be allowed to trade, and the customers in terms of social distancing, in terms of sanitation, and in terms of also other health measures that shall be required to mitigate the impact or the, the contamination or the, uh, the, the transmission of, 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 of COVID. So therefore, those other arrangements shall be subject to those health protocols just to ensure that we, could, we mitigate against you know, the, uh, the transmission. And also to make sure that health standards and measures are in place at those places. Okay. John, just to say, that it's, it's not new. This has been, these are the same protocols that have been imposed on, on those that are in a formal market. Okay. So this is not an additional burden that is placed only on informal okay. traders or in, in, in open markets. It, we do require it even for Vierman Brock or Checkers or ShopRite okay. or whoever it is okay. that is trading at the moment. Thank you very much. Let's talk about the definition of liquor. It's, uh, it, 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 it caught my attention that, um, yeah, I don't want to give the answer, but would you mind to talk about the definition of liquor in terms of, and also the prohibition in terms of selling and purchasing? Okay, very well. So, so John, I'm going to speak to, to, the, to the broad uh, tenants of it and, and I'll allow the, the Attorney General to go into some technical uh, detail if he needs to. But, but let me just start off by saying, just because there is a state of emergency doesn't mean that existing legislation, like the Liga Act 6 of 1998, uh, are no longer in operation. All statutes uh, continue to operate unless the, the president, by proclamation or by regulation, specifically suspends it. So I think uh, I want the Namibian public to understand that it doesn't stop operating. Um, so what we have done, because in the first set of regulations, uh, we had alcohol, for example, and it wasn't too clearly defined. And so what we found is that law enforcement was struggling to, to um, in some instances, uh, have an offense because it was unclear whether or not a particular drink falls within the ambit of what is alcohol or what is liquor. Uh, and so when we were amending, we thought, okay, the, the best way that we can deal with it is to go back to existing legislation, which is your Liga Act 6 of 1998. And it actually defines uh, what is um, liquor. It, it has a broad category that you would have seen in the regulations. But also, something that also caught my attention earlier before I came here was the issue around Tombo. And Tombo is actually also defined in, in the Liga Act. So we have what we've done is we've lifted the provisions of the Liga Act and placed it in the regulation. So if there is any challenge or difficulty in, in accepting the text that is provided in the regulations, then um, I think people have a right to challenge that provision of the Liga Act. Um, you know, because that's what, so what we've done is to simply follow uh, what is, what is um, already in existence so that we could clarify because people are saying this is not and that is um, and so forth. And I know that members of the public may have some concerns 
um, about the manner in which we've lifted it, but it's not something new, it exists. And if, if members of the public, and I know that, for example, um, there's been some concerns about the provisions of the Liga Act, but for the moment, that is what we are working okay. with. Mr. Attorney General, it's like when it comes to the selling or purchasing of, 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 of liquor, however defined, uh, there's obviously there's a penalty to be imposed. But I was just wondering, it's like the 2000 across the board, whether you are buying or whether you are selling. Is there not a, an inconsistency? In, in, it's like what disincentive is there, for example, the, the person that is selling alcohol not to sell if on, only the penalty to be imposed is only at 2000 Would you mind talking about that? Well, the intention of these regulations are not really to punish people. That, that's not the intention. The intention is really to control certain activities during the state of emergency and particularly during the period that is stipulated in this case, during the lockdown period, as to which activities people can engage in and which activities should not, cannot engage in. So, therefore, the issue about the, the 2,000, that's actually the effect, that's the maximum amount that should be imposed. But should you then be found guilty, you can be up by that 2,000 plus, you know, six months imprisonment. But the main reason really is to require people to comply without necessarily being forced. It should not be viewed as a, a law enforcement issue. It should be looked at from the health point of view and from the, you know, saving lives point of view. To sort of say that Namibians, we are faced with a serious pandemic. It's a challenge to the whole country, not only Namibia, but to the whole world. As we have seen that people are dying all over the world, Spain, US, England, China. So therefore, before we are faced with such a critical situation, we have to put certain measures in place and we have identified certain areas that need to be controlled. Sale of liquor is being one of them because there has been explanation why that need to be controlled for obvious reasons. So therefore, the amounts that are stipulated there, it should not really be good to say that, look, you know, you should just pay and then continue. Obviously, if there is, you know, a tendency of some people are displaying a propensity of engaging these activities, you know, regularly, then we have to look at the reason why would somebody do that. I think any, you know, Namibians who is, uh, you know, patriotic will definitely look at it as this is, should not be viewed as a law enforcement issue, but it should be looked at from the health point of view also, from the, okay. the point of view of saving lives. So therefore we believe that we, there was a balance between, you know, getting people to, to, to comply and also to ensure that where there is a need to control it. At least there is some element of deterrence in the, in the law. Okay, okay. John, Very quickly, because we've yeah, got yeah, quite just, a just to say, John, that uh, we must remember that when, when the issue of liquor, the prohibition of liquor came about, um, a, a lot of people were, were really, I think, to, to use the colloquial, taking chances. Um, so, uh, and, and, and I think there is confusion about what, is, what powers do the police have? We must remember that the police continue to operate under the Police Act of 1990 and in, in, in section 13 and 14 of, of, that, of that statute. There are very broad powers that the police have in terms of um, if they see that somebody is either suspected of about to commit offence, in this instance, um, either buying or selling uh, uh, liquor or alcohol, um, or if, if they have the, if they can, if, you, if they find you in possession. I, I find this quite interesting. I discovered that in section 40 of the Criminal Procedure Act, it actually says, without a warrant, a peace officer, which is a police officer, is entitled to to, if you're found to be, to find you to be in, in violation uh, or to about to commit an offense. So I think we just need to understand what, what is the, the amount of, what is the extent of powers police have when they find you in possession of alcohol? Um, can, would you be found to be suspected of having committed an offense? That offense being either having sold okay. or bought alcohol. Okay. So the next regulation that caught my eyes is like the one, uh, regulation number 15, which deals with the closure of schools and higher education institutions. But I've 
What I've noticed is that the period for opening of schools, for example, has been removed. Mm -hmm. Would it be right to say that schools and higher education institutions has now been indefinitely closed? Can that be the reading? Um, I think for, we have removed the time period because we don't know, you know what the decisions would be as we go al going along. Um, but I think we, the, the, the removal of, of the time period is informed by the fact that, you know, we don't know what the health situation would be. And we all know that COVID-19 is, is um, spread through congregation of, of groups and schools, as we know, is probably the most vulnerable space that our children can find itself. Uh, so we want to avoid that situation. But teaching and learning, um, as you can also see in the regulations, is, has, is not stopping. It's, in fact, it's, it's starting. I know that some private schools actually already started, and the state schools um, are also in, in they're making arrangements. There will be directives to that effect, making arrangements to start the process of, of e-learning and, and also distance learning so that we can cater for, because I know the biggest criticism at the moment is that not everyone has access to e-learning facilities. How does the government uh, catch that, that group? Uh, which, which would in many instances be vulnerable to, to address their concerns. And I think that those are the details that they're working on. The, the idea and the intention really is to make sure that no child, no Namibian child, That's that right. is entitled to a basic education is, ex is excluded okay. from that learning process. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, uh, talk to us about the amendment that has been brought up uh, into with regard to public gathering. Is there any amendments made in that regard, in terms of the numbers? In terms of the numbers, uh, unfortunately not, uh, for good reasons. Uh, because there has been a lot of debates about whether the number that is provided in the regulations is realistic, is practical. Obviously, we all understand that we are faced with an unprecedented situation of disproportional magnitude. So therefore, we have to look into drastic actions that would help us to suppress the pandemic. And we are informed by our colleagues from the health sector that, you know, if we can at least look into the issue of gathering to try to reduce the numbers, that will help us to really combat COVID. So therefore, the numbers of, 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 of people uh, that constitute public gathering has not changed, it's still at 10. Uh, if you are more than 10, then actually that, 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 that's unlawful. The effect of the matter is that we have looked at some aspects. We look at uh, certain settings where you might find that, for example, family members that could be more than 10 in one household. Then we realize that we have to make provisions for that. We open it up to say, look, if there are more than you know, 10 people that reside in the same household, that's the reality, we cannot change that. Then that shall not be deemed to be, you know, that. So therefore, those, that's one of the, uh, the area that we have looked at. But we are mindful of the fact that this situation could be complex in some settings where people live under very, very difficult conditions. So therefore, we are trying to mitigate the situation by looking at the balance, you know, to see how best can we mitigate the situation in terms of reducing the number of people, and in terms also, you know, looking at how we can put measures in place that would not expose people unnecessarily to, 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 uh, to the spread of uh, COVID. The other night uh, on national uh, television, we've seen uh, Commissioner Shikongo, I think, of the Comas region. It's a group of uh, people in, in somewhere in Katatura that were jogging, and they were in a big group of people, and they had to be stopped and whatever. What, what does the regulation say about people that are exercising and all those things? And if people that are coincidentally meeting, do, do that also constitute a gathering of yes. 10? John, I think the regulations are, are fairly clear and I think they are flexible in that, in that regard. It recognizes that certain activities you know, shall continue, you know, attendance of certain you know, activities. People might find themselves in a, you know, situations where probably at the pharmacies, 
at banks or certain shops. But those arrangements, those uh, congregations are also regulated in terms of health. So to say that there must be some measures to determine social distancing, must be a mid-time part between two people, and therefore there must all be you know, certain elements of sanitation there. However, when it comes to the issues of uh, you know, moving people to go outside, for example, to go to the shops or to go to the pharmacy or to go and exercise, there are limitations there that are put in the, in the regulations for good reasons. And it is our feeling that the number that is stipulated are quite reasonable. Mm. However, what we are realizing is that maybe with time people start to realize the magnitude and the importance of some of these uh, requirements because it's, this is really, as I said, it's not an enforcement issue. It should be about our own health and precautions that we need to, to put in place. Okay. So it is, we believe that the numbers that are put in place are reasonable. For exercising, for example, three people, that's the maximum. But we are seeing that quite a big number of people are going out in, in mass. And that, that's not uh, good, and that's not lawful. Okay. So therefore, we want to encourage, we want to encourage Namibians mm -hmm. to really look at this issue from a different perspective, say, look, it's my own health if I'm exposed and I get infected. There is also a big chance that I'll also transmit that to my own family members or to the people that I come from. Thank you very much. John, just to say, yeah. we, we do encourage uh, Namibians to, to, when they exercise, exercise with other family members. There is a reason why we have restrictions um, and confinement to residences, because we want people to generally be around their own family members. So, uh, and, and, and also, I encourage Namibians to do any exercise within uh, their neighborhoods, so that we avoid people congregating. And so the kinds of videos we've seen, I think, it does, does, is a little bit disheartening because it does create the impression that, that we are not serious as a nation in some instances yeah. about the containment of the further spread sure, of COVID-19. Just, just, just on that one, I think we also need to look at our own behavior because I think we need to accept that this is an extraordinary situation that we are in. There are various spots or routes in, in, in our neighborhood or in Vendok that are quite popular where people go there in big numbers to either jog or to hike. So we want to tell people that, look, since there is this situation that we are faced with, we should also try to minimize our activities going through those busy routes or busy spots so that we don't end up actually congregating big numbers. So then that will also make the uh, work of the law enforcement officers very difficult to control these movements. So we should, by all means, as Namibians, try to see what is that we can do within limits to keep doing what we are allowed to do within the law at the same time also to make it easier for the law enforcement officer to do their job. Which actually brings me to the next question. Last night on national, radio, on national television, 8 o'clock news, uh, Commissioner Shikongo actually lamented the fact uh, that according to him, uh, they can't do anything about people that are freely moving around and whatever because in his view, there's nothing that, that there's no regulation that tells them what to do in such instances. Is that understanding right? Um, I think it's, I, I would see it as maybe just uh, anxiety and, and frustration about uh, individual members of our society not taking responsibility for their own health. I think there is enough uh, provisions within the scope of, of the regulations, but also within the scope of the uh, Police Act and the Criminal Procedure Act to, to provide the police uh, within reason, of course, where it's necessary and reasonable um, that they can take certain steps. Uh, f for example, to, to, to if you want, uh, comp have people comply with the regulations. Let me just say this, John. What we have in the regulations is and, I, and, I, and this is really a footnote to what the, uh, the Attorney General was saying, is that the idea was really just to encourage people to, to comply. But where people blatantly disregard uh, instructions from, from the Namibian police or from an, a lawful uh, authorized officer, 
um, they are in contravention of the regulations. Now, typically, what the police should do, even when they find a, a public gathering or when they see a group of people exercising, the first thing that they're entitled to do uh, by the regulations is to ask people to disperse um, or to even tell people to return to their homes if they are of the view uh, from what they're seeing that the situation is no longer in compliance with social distancing, in compliance with hygiene and all the other requirements that we have, um, they can ask people to go back. If people refuse to heed that instruction, they have, they are entitled to, under the Criminal Procedure Act, under the powers that are provided for under Section 14 of the Police Act, they can then, uh, you know, tell someone that you have now committed or you are about to commit an offense, uh, giving them another opportunity, I suppose, to say, okay, no, I, I'm going to turn back or I'm going to stop what I'm doing. Uh, they can then be, you know, basically charged and fined. Now, the, the fine of, of 2000 is linked to the fact that under the Criminal Procedure Act, police officers actually are authorized to give fines up to 6,000 million dollars, usually. So they can give a person, uh, they can arrest them if they refuse, uh, or, and, and give them an opportunity to go to, to, go to the police station uh, to uh, get an admission of guilt, or they can give them a written notice to appear. So if you, you are given an opportunity to make the payment, and if you don't make the payment, you'd get an opportunity normally to go and um, appear in court. So police have, have the latitude to actually give people fines. And, and the, the payment will not happen right, right there, but you'd then be taken to the police station and arrangements would be made for payment. So and I think just people just need to find ways of complying with the regulations. Mm -hmm. Mr. Attorney General, with regard to the operation and closure of certain businesses as uh, captured under regulation number 12, I, I, I found this kind of worry. It says that all businesses are supposed to, uh, of course, produce proof of registration. And with regard to the meme that is selling fat cakes, because she's also an informal trader. Does it mean that Meme that is selling fat cakes or whatever it is, must also produce some kind of proof of registration in terms of these regulations? Well, I think we need to draw a difference between the uh, business that are properly registered under BIPA, as they say, and the, the open markets and informal traders. Of course, there are certain requirements in terms of the local authorities uh, or in terms of the, the bylaws that will require people who intend to do certain things within the, uh, the jurisdictions of those local authorities to either be registered with the local authorities or with other, probably the Minister of Trade, for example. So in terms of the approach to the, uh, speak to the issue of uh, open markets and informal traders, I think there is a separate regime that regulates that. Okay. And those requirements are basically set out by the Minister of Urban in collaboration with the, uh, with the, with the local authorities. So therefore, the, the requirements are not as strict as those uh, that applies to the formal business. Okay. And okay. the main intention is really to make sure that the people are able to make a living and also to provide the services. And that is confined to essential services only. And in this case, it, 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 it's regulated in such a manner that it doesn't frustrate also the, the intention of the, okay. the regulation. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney General. I want us to elaborate on offenses and penalties as captured under regulation number 15. What caught my eye is the criminalization of the spread of fake news and misinformation. So my question is, how is this going to be uh, policed, so to speak? John. Is this not a case of impossibility? I'm not sure about impossibility because your normal rules uh, pertaining to uh, whether it's civil or criminal proceedings and evidence continue uh, to operate. That's the first point. But the second point is you must remember, John, you, you have your general elements of any offense, including whatever you do. So you must remember whatever you do, um, is it permitted by law? You know, if it's not permitted by law, it's unlawful. Uh, do you have the intention to 
to cause harm. Um, so your causation and your harm element is then included in there. And, and so, so you need to ask yourself, is, your, your, is what you're about to do, whether it is that you are distributing something that you've just received from some, someone, is it about to cause some kind of he uh, uh, harm and is it allowed by law? We have criminalized it because I think we, we understood that there is a growing concern, I think globally as well, um, about the increase in fake news. So, you, you know, it, it doesn't capture all of it, but what we are saying is, we know, the, the normal rules of evidence would apply if we have to determine whether or not um, somebody should be held liable for the distribution of fake news. Right. Um, I've also still on the issue of the offenses and penalties. It's like there's this growing concern that some of the police officers, of course, during this time, they are vested with uh, great discretionary powers. Um, and for me, I've, I've noticed that omission that there's no penalization for any police officer in terms of the regulations. And I know uh, there are normal laws that would apply and whatever, but why does the regulation not specifically address and try to deter police officers uh, from abusing possibly their powers? John, as it has been pointed out earlier that the existing laws that regulate certain conduct either of the law enforcement officer or the members of the public still remain in place. Obviously, we have picked up certain cases or incidents where members of the public have been subjected to some abuse or maybe violation of their rights. And that is a straightforward criminal matter. The members of the public should not hesitate in any manner to report those cases to the police so that those members are dealt with. In fact, as I'm talking to you, we have had situations where some of these cases have been picked up and certain actions have been been taken and we have engaged our colleagues from the uh, from defense and from the police to really make sure that this kind of conduct are not tolerated because the fact of the matter is that the whole intention of this whole process is to protect Namibians. So therefore, if we use heavy-handed in terms of uh, enforcement of the law, to the extent where we uh, basically violate the rights of the citizens, that, that's not the intention. So therefore, if there is in any way the citizens whose rights are being violated, they are entitled to proceed and lay criminal charges you know, against those police officers. And then we are encouraging people to do so where it is there are valid complaints. We don't want cases where people simply, because they don't want to comply, and then they complain. Mm -hmm. That's also not good. Okay. Good. John, just to say, precisely because the ordinary laws that are provided for under the Police Act of 1990 are sufficient, we needed not to repeat that in the regulations. There are at least five provisions in that Act that just focuses on, on disciplining, disciplining the police. I must also tell you and reaffirm that both the head of state and the inspector general and, and members of the security cluster have been consistent, at least publicly, to indicate that they, whatever they're doing, they want to do it within the paradigm of human rights. Um, uh, you know, but one cannot always uh, hold the entire cluster responsible. For, for the actions of individual members. We have the Inspector General and the Chief of Defense on record as having indicated people who have acted in gross violation of human rights and, and, and total dis flagrant disregard of our, the dignity of our people have been disciplined. So I have, I have no doubt that in terms of the institutions that exist, the processes that we have, and the laws that we have at the moment are sufficient to address concerns okay. of misconduct of our members of the, of, of the, of the police force, yeah, police no. and defense forces. Yeah. No, thank you very much. In fact, uh, you remind me of what the president last week said uh, in terms of this announcement is like uh, reminding the, the police officers yes. that 
the people are not your enemies. Yes. Like you are doing this for the people and so, so that should be the bottom line. And the people should also see the police as not as their enemy, exactly. but that we are all doing something okay. that we are all not familiar with how to address. Okay. I mean, there are some learnings as we, as we go along. Yes. John, just to add, this is a very, very important aspect in terms of the implementation of these regulations that for us to be, be able to succeed in this process, we need the cooperation between the law enforcement officers and members of the public. So therefore, the public must do its part, and the law enforcement officer should also make sure that they, get, they act within the law. So that is the only way. Otherwise, if you have one side pulling in another you know, the direction, yeah. then we shall not be able to succeed in doing so. Yeah. Therefore, we want to urge members of the public to try by all means to comply with the law and also to assist the law enforcement agencies to be able to carry out their, their, their functions properly. And we want also to urge also our colleagues from the law enforcement agencies to make sure that where there is doubt, they should always seek clarification so that we don't find ourselves yes. on the wrong side of the law. Very good. Uh, Madam Minister, speak to us about uh, this notion of zones and how does that overlap with regions? Why, why was there a need to, to rather talk about zones and not of regions in this particular instance. Uh, John, let me start now. I, I would want the Attorney General to, uh, to amplify uh, when I'm done. Is the, the idea really was to make essential services accessible to the people. That, that's the first point. And what we realized is, so the zones are not taking away from the regions. Uh, zones really is just a practical arrangement that has been made by the security cluster for purposes of managing the movement of, of persons and goods. Because remember, it's not only people that move, but of course, uh, goods can't move without people. Um, so so what, we, the, what they then proposed, and this is really a proposition uh, from the security cluster, was to say, let's I, put all the regions in zones. What that does is it allows, unlike Thomas and Erongo, for instance, um, not all the regions are self-sufficient. So the idea and the intention really was to make sure that those areas in the zones, uh, villages, uh, towns, and so forth, that may not have access to, for example, a shopping complex or have access to medical and other supplies, would be allowed by a zonal arrangement to have access to those supplies without the inhibitions that comes with if you want to move from one region to the other one, you would not be allowed to. But what the security class has also done is apart from putting us into 10 zones, is they have also have what they call a 69 lockdown spaces. So there is not going to be a free flow of movement within the zone itself. And, and again, what is it that we want to achieve? We want to firstly contain the virus, and how do we do it? We do that by reducing the number of people that move around, but also a number of people that congregate at any given time. We've had some challenges in this area. I mean, we've seen queues where people don't have social distancing and so forth, and I think that's an aspect um, that, we, that we're working on. So, so John, uh, the long and short of it is, that was the idea, is to cluster groups um, and allow for some liberal movement uh, for purposes of people uh, accessing essential services. Okay. Anything to add? Yes, uh, John, I think what we need to understand is that now that the, the lockdown is countrywide, we need to understand that the movement of people between the zones is, is restricted, mm -hmm. subject to, of course, to the exemptions that are provided for in the regulations. So therefore, people who wish to move from one zone to the other, they require to have a permit if they are not providing certain services, for example. So, but this is not meant to frustrate people who have valid reasons to travel, but it's really just to control the movement of people. But we have also noted that in the process, when this latitude was created, people have actually gone overboard in the sense that People basically go there to the police or to designated officers who are designated to issue these permits to travel for reasons that are not 
necessarily valid. As a result, we have big, big uh, you know, traffic of people who were either moving out of commerce or coming to commerce, and that has really caused the worry in terms of you know, the authorities how to manage and control that situation. So therefore, we want to encourage citizens to understand that this has been put in place to really address a critical situation. However, those who have to travel because of valid reasons, they must do so subject to those provisions. But we don't want a situation where people mm. who just want to travel as if you know, things are normal. And we want also to encourage you know, those who are in charge in terms of issuing these permits to do so in a resp responsible manner so as to not defeat the purpose of this whole you know, exercise. Mm. We've almost come to the end of the set of questions that I'm having, uh, but we, I know we spoke earlier about critical services, Yvonne, mm -hmm. uh, but I've seen farming. Uh, would you mind to elaborate on farming, uh, the fishing industry, and mining being critical services? Again, you know, COVID has, has in a way plunged us into a situation where uh, at very short notice, we had to almost bring all activities, both social, economic, and otherwise, to a halt. Um, and, and the idea is that uh, we must still, you know, we're still a country, we, we still have needs as a, as a nation, uh, and, we continue, and we need to continue to survive um, economically and otherwise. So the idea uh, you'd have seen in the first round of, of the lockdown uh, period, you know, there was a almost complete halt to all economic activity, and we can't have that. I think, uh, econ I'm not an economist, but I think economists are basically saying to us, we can't have that situation because we don't know when we will get out of the hoods on, on this one. Mm -hmm. So there were certain um, uh, you know, sectors of the economy that were identified as kick-starting the process of bringing life back, particularly in our economy. You know, you can understand why agriculture, uh, fishing, and so forth are at the forefront of, of wanting to make sure that when uh, come the 4th of May or come the 5th of May, there are some activities that are already injecting capital uh, in, into the life of the Namibian economy. So that was the, the idea behind it. Okay. And, and, and this, actually, these discussions are coming from, from members of society saying we cannot just go to sleep as a nation. We need to start doing some small things mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. uh, compromising on the health protocols that we've yeah. put in place. So all the requirements that we have for everyone in respect of those that are critical services um, are required to make sure that we have social distancing, we have hygiene, and all the and, and that they, they, there are some exceptions to public gatherings. Uh, for example, members of cabinet, for obvious reasons, uh, cannot just be ten people. But we need to make sure that the environment in which we meet and and how we meet and so forth are in compliance with the health protocols. Professor, John, just to to highlight the fact that of course we know that uh, the with the declaration of a state of emergency and also the implementation of these restrictions. Of course, Namibia, probably the people of Namibia are going through a very, very difficult uh, time in terms of movements, in terms of access to certain facilities. And this is part of the reason, I think, where certain activities have been opened up. And that process continues. You know, the authorities shall continue to review certain areas to look at uh, which other activities that can be looked into with the whole purpose of, you know, to gradually, you know, phase them in so that at least we can mitigate the impact of the, uh, this situation on the economy. Because we believe that at the same time, when we are trying to save lives, we also must also look at the state of the economy and say how best can we find a fine balance between the two, so as to, to ensure that the, the economy is not completely you know, uh, put under pressure to the extent we are, that we are not able to carry out, you know, uh, to carry out uh, our activities that we need to do. At the same time also to see how best we can you know, put measures in place to mitigate the transmission. So, therefore, there is a process that is going on to, to make assessment to see which areas, economic activities that we can look into to, and see how best we can open up 
those areas without necessarily compromising the, uh, you know, the, the health of the Namibian people. And we believe that with time, we shall be able to, you know, come to a situation where say maybe said some of the, these restrictions shall fall away, but that should, shall then be informed on the, you know, by a very thorough assessment of the situation from the economic and health point of view. So therefore, the process continues. It could be that even before, by the end of, the, uh, of this period that is set by the 4th of, of May, there could be some other changes that could come into force, either to reduce or to reduce certain measures, you know, to, to, by looking at the impact on the economy and also by looking at what measures that need to be in place in terms of the health protocol. Thank you very much. Uh, these were the questions that I had in terms of my preparations. Maybe if you feel that I've left out some of the issues that needs to be brought to the attention of the nation, please feel free to, to use this opportunity to clarify before we go and, and open the lines for the general public to pose whatever questions they might have. Minister? I think, John, uh, you know, this is perfect opportunity for us to engage with the public. So we're happy to uh, take the questions and, and respond to uh, any specific concerns okay. that members of the public may have. So that provides them with more opportunity to ask the questions. We're happy okay. to answer them. I think, that, that, I think that would be the best way because I think we would probably want to hear from the okay. public as to what are the key issues that need to be addressed from our okay. point of view and uh, we are more than ready to provide the answers to those questions. I'm, I'm just want to use, I just want to use the opportunity to say that we are going to open the, the floor now to the general public for questions, but if someone could kindly assist us in giving us the number that members of the general public can call to, so as to ask the question, and whilst we are waiting for that number, I will then start with the, with the journalists in the house to pose their questions. And again, this, uh, the questions can be to both the first set that was done in terms of the health update, if there were outstanding questions. I've, see, I've noticed one of the journalists that wanted to ask a question, or it can also relate to part two of the panel discussion, which relates very specifically to the regulations. Mr. Deng. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, John, and thank you very much to the panel. Good morning as well. Um, I've got, just got a th uh, three questions. Uh, it's around the, first of all, public gatherings, and we see that Parliament is, is mentioned there. If, uh, for one other reason, during the lockdown, Parliament has to reconvene, under what, how will it be constituted? Because uh, actually two-thirds can also uh, set and... Uh, and, and Parliament business can continue in that. But just to elaborate and explain how Parliament would operate under those circumstances. The other one is around uh, fake news, and uh, it's quite a new uh, crime, so to speak, if we, we say it like that. But also, it, it has the burden of intention. How would we prove that somebody, maybe out of panic, has now spread fake news and so on? Um, and, and perhaps the other one, uh, there are certain websites, certain institutions that, that deals with verification of fake news. For instance, Namibia Fact Check, there's also Africa Fact Check, uh, and uh, perhaps that calls for uh, education around um, uh, media literacy and uh, education of the public to go to those websites before actually uh, spreading such fake news. The, my last question is around the, the lockdown. Are we likely to see or are we thinking around phasing out the lockdown uh, gradually instead of uh, just simply uh, opening the country again? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll take one. The, the lady was first. There was a lady at the back. I'll give her first because she was earlier. Please introduce yourself and the media house, man. Hello, I'm a member of the public. Okay. I'm also trained in medicine a little bit. I want to thank our government and all the action group, and especially John, for the concern for our people. Thank you. And I want to honor our fathers of the nation, especially Tate Sem Nuyoma, Tate Yifikupunye Pohamba, and our father of the nation. Um, President Hage Gengo. 
You don't know that you have a secret admirer club. It will probably make you very proud, but I must, yeah, I must say it pertains more to your very honored mothers and fathers. Because these Tate and Memenkulu, Tate and Kulu, Memenkulu, they reached 108 years. Tate Sam's mother reached 108 years. Tate Pohamba's mother reached 98 years. And since 15 years, I've been collecting some data and meeting many friends, and I want to greet all my friends to honor our old, our seniors. Our beautiful seniors start in Kulu Kulu of the nation, many of whom reached over 100 years. And I want to testify that we have in Namibia not only one of the healthiest climates, but we also have one of the strongest and most resilient people of the world. And I pertain, it's due to the very, very healthy traditional foods. Mahango has been shown to be one of the healthiest staple foods of the world. Omboa is teeming with minerals and vitamins. Oshikundu, fresh oshikundu made in the evening and drink in the morning is teeming with natural healthy microbiology, microbes. So I want to testify that we have I want to just encourage our old people, stay with your traditional foods. You get vitamins, minerals, and you will stay very healthy. Thank you very much. And I have four questions. Oh. The mortality. <laughs> I would like to know the normal mortality in Namibia. What is our, in the last three years always, please, our media people get to work. What has been our no normal mortality daily, weekly, monthly, seasonal fluctuation in the winter season? And what is the annual normal mortality rate of our 2,583 million people? Please get to work for, for the last years. Secondly, I want to know the disease and case definition. Um, we you are to, can you repeat that question, please? Can you repeat that question? The second, the second one? The disease and case definition. Okay. With my medical training, I have learned that we are actually meeting every day many, many microbes, many viruses, many bacteria, and in the symbiosis of our body, the microbes that have a healthy life with us are actually more um, uh, they are more than our body cells. Okay. The healthy microbes are more than our body cells. They are also po positive virus, which prevent diseases. Okay. So, um, I would like to know, if we say a person is infected, that means that your body has had a meeting with a microbe, which could be a, a, a virus or a bacteria. If you have a good immune system, then that's it. You've had a meeting and you get an antigen, antibody response. So the last question, ma'am? And the, the question is, why do we call um, infected people cases or diseased people? Because only once they get symptoms, develop symptoms, then they can be diseased cases, then they can be cases. Otherwise, if they have a normal immunity, then there cannot be cases, even if they find the virus in them. Okay. Then the other question is, our normal... That would be the last one, ma'am. Yes, eh? our normal hospi hospital bed occupation, what has it been in the last three years? What is, the, what is the capacity of every hospital? How are they occupied? How have they been occupied? When are they full of every hospital? I think okay. that's very important numbers we should get. Thank you very much. Thank you very much right. and all the best to our strong people in Namibia. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Do we have someone from the health uh, sector that can answer some of these very specific health related questions? Please. I'll attempt to answer some, but some need preparations. I don't have the data for previous years. It's where requested 
I might need to get that and update at some stage later. Uh, specifically, the first question and the last question, I will not be able to provide that data right now. Question number two, which is asking on the... So you cannot provide us uh, with the mortality rate? The normal mortality rate and hospital bed occupancy for the last three years. That I need to consult oh, okay. and get back. Okay, thank you. But on the... Though it was not a bit clear, because you asked the disease and case definition, because uh, the case definition, specifically for COVID-19, which we have adopted from the WHO guideline, we have uh, I splitted these definitions in three groups. We have the suspect case, we have uh, a probable case, and we have a confirmed case. A suspect case is a patient with acute respiratory illness, like fever, and at least one of the following, like cough, shortness of breath, and a history of travel, to all residents within the location reporting community transmission of COVID-19 cases within the period of 14 days prior to the symptoms onset or the beginning of the onset. Or a patient with acute respiratory illness and having been in contact with a confirmed or a probable COVID-19 case in the last 14 days prior to the symptom start. Or a patient with severe acute respiratory illness, meaning that this person is having a fever and at least one of the symptoms like cough, shortness of breath, and this person require hospitalization and the clinician could not rule out other conditions that become a suspect. So once you suspect, is then when you move into testing for you to confirm. Once you test this person you are suspecting and you get your laboratory confirmation that the result is positive, that's when we say we have a confirmed case. So per definition, a confirmed case is a person with laboratory confirmation of COVID-19 infection, irrespective of clinical signs and symptoms. At times, maybe it's a contact, then uh, for one reason or the other, this person is tested, because some people may carry the virus and they don't, their body does not react so that they show the signs and symptoms. This person might be a contact, get laboratory test. If the laboratory confirm that the virus is there, again, this person become a confirmed case, though he might not have presented symptoms. While a probable case, again, always the beginning is a suspect. It's a suspected case for whom the testing of COVID-19 is inconclusive. Because in the laboratory, there are different methods of testing. First, you do the screening test and a confirmatory test. If there is a discordancy or the, the results are not showing the same, one is showing positive, one is showing negative, is when we say this result is inconclusive or indeterminate. Then we classify that as probable and is treated as a confirmed case. Related to this, Question number three asked now why are we calling um, infected people as cases? This is just because of the mere definition which I have given. As we know, when the body, when the, there is an introduction of a foreign material in the body, as you have rightfully indicated, it could be a bacteria, 
it could be a virus. The body is having its own defense mechanism, the immune system. If the immune system is strong, then the body starts reacting. That's when the, the body starts fighting back and you develop now signs and symptoms. That's an indication that the body is, trying, is fighting, trying to get rid of that what is, does not belong there. Okay. So that's merely based on that, then we say this is a case. So it could be a person who is sick, fighting the, that disease, or there might be that body is not fighting. It could be a carrier, but once the, the confirmation is there, then we refer as such. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for question number one that was asked by uh, Mr. Denk, I'm also informed uh, that there's a lot of incoming calls. So I would want the panelists not to take so much time, but just to be very succinct. Uh, the question about public gathering as it relates to parliament. Let me, let me just say, Article 53 of the Constitution uh, has made provision for quorum. And so there can be a quorum of 49 members of parliament. Remember, there are 96 voting members and eight non-voting. So if there is a matter that needs to be voted on, like a budget, for example, uh, parliament can decide whether they want to meet as 49. If it's not a matter that requires voting, 26 members. That's, that's a short and the, the, the second part of it, and I think maybe the important part, is that we have made provision now in, in the regulations where we say that the requirement for public gatherings of 10 persons um, you know, is an except parliament, cabinet, and any other institution that requires more than 10 people to, uh, for the prevention, combating of the further spread of COVID-19, they are allowed to meet. But the, they must make sure that they meet in an environment that complies with the health protocols. What, what parliament will probably need is if they need all 106, 104 members to be in attendance, they may need a bigger space so that they social distancing and those kinds of okay, things. Okay, thank you very much. There was this question for both of you. Either one of you can, can uh, attempt to answer. Also, with regard to proving intention for the spreading of fake news, misinformation or disinformation. Will that not prove difficult? Well, as it was said earlier by by my colleague, that, uh, that the law of evidence has not changed. So that basically shall be subjected to the same process if there is good reasons why a certain person should be charged for having violated uh, the provisions of the regulations. So therefore, the prosecution should have to go through the same process. So therefore, that is a matter that can be proven or disproven in the court of law. Okay. So therefore, we, the intention is really to put these provisions to the regulations is to simply say that, look, we should not allow a situation where people might be tempted to spread or misinformation or incorrect information in the public under these, these circumstances. Okay. So, therefore, that's the, the reason. So the burden will still be proving beyond it's still on reasonable state. doubt. The burden is still on the state, and okay. unless the evidential burden uh, you know, passes during trial. Okay. okay. And then one, one last question with regard to that was whether we are looking at the face, uh, the facing it out the lockdown versus an abrupt closure. I yes. mean, abrupt end, sorry. I, I think uh, 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 Peter Denk is answering his own question because I think there is, we, we don't want to be, the way we've been launched by COVID-19 to come to an abrupt situation where we had to declare a state of emergency and so forth, it's not the kind of way that we want to get out of it. So there's certainly uh, all intention to make Sorry sure. Sorry to interrupt. No We've got our first question and um, first question, member from the public that wants to pose a question. You may go ahead, sir. Yes, Emmanuel, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, um, thank you very much. I want to thank the Honorable Minister and the Attorney General that is there. My question is just about the public gatherings, especially funerals. I find out and I have seen some WhatsApps that the public gathering is um, 10 and more, but you will find out that people, especially in rural areas, because of different um, traditions that they attach their moral to funerals, you find uh, more than 100 people at a funeral and they try to sit from this tree to that tree and say, but we are here, but we are still have social distancing. So I wanted to find out why 
is that um, not maybe relaxed to say, okay, for things like especially funerals because of our culture, uh, we have to allow, say, 50 people or so and then have strict information from law enforcement officers to, to, to really adhere to that, for the community to adhere to that. Because I'm seeing that um, people saying, no, why 10? For example, an African man will have 15, 20 children and they all want to go and bury their father. And then that number is already um, over the, uh, the number that is required for public gatherings. How is the, how are we going to uh, look at that? And then we've got all the challenges that we have people that are working at homes. For example, spray paintings and, and these people. They have three, four cars at home that they are working on. If the police find a son and a father just this is spray painting a car, they will come and say, no, you should not do work now and um, we have COVID. Uh, please stop your job or they take the paint and throw it out and so on. So what do we mean by by not working off, by working at home, especially for these people like spray paintings or mechanics? That's my question. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a, a quick response. Um, and I think the, the, the conversation around funerals um, is delicate because it also has to do with religious and, and cultural practices. But it's also uh, found to have been the place that people uh, congregate the most. And, and, and people are much more susceptible uh, to the kind of close contact interaction uh, that you'd, you that you'd want to avoid. So we, in, in this instance, uh, it's an ongoing discussion um, at this point, but I think the, we will be guided by what the health experts say. Uh, about us opening up that space, but we we have, you know, the, people also need to be a little bit creative about how they uh, conduct themselves during that period of time. Um, there are other benefits, you know, reduced costs, but also, you know, you can have a breakdown of people coming uh, to pray their respects in in groups of ten. So people can be creative about how they deal with it in the meantime. But but we will take it as as an ongoing discussion for the okay. moment. But I take that point. There was also this question about informal traders working from home. Um, are those people, if I got the question correctly, are those people prohibited from working, doing the spray, the spray painting right there from home? Can they continue doing that because they are working from home? Depends on how many there. Maybe working from home, we need to understand exactly what the setup is. Because sometimes, if it is in the rural area, for example, they, it would be a different set of rules altogether. But let's assume that it's happening in the in towns, for example. I think that's when one needs to really understand what is that is required in terms of the health measures that need to be in place wherever you are working from, so that you don't, so that you can you put measures in place in terms of uh, you know social distancing, in terms of hygienic standards mm -hmm. that are required for you to be able to carry out okay. that. Uh, so that, ten that people can work at home. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We've got a second caller, Fritz from Riobot. Fritz, can you hear us? Fritz, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, you can go okay. ahead, sir. I, I have one question. Um, it's, it's concerning the economy. Wouldn't it be better to keep, keep the borders closed, make wearing um, the face mask compulsory and social distancing compulsory, but open the businesses. Fred, uh, we much really can't hear you much better than Hello, Hello Fred? Uh, yes? There's an echo. Yeah. We, we really can't hear you properly. Okay. Would you mind repeating it again? All right. Um, wouldn't it be better? That's, it's really, it's really very bad. We can't hear you. Okay, I try to phone again. Can you, can you, can you kindly call us back? It's your line. I will call you again. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Right. There was a question on on public gathering. Do we have another caller? Okay. John. Uh, public gathering. Yes, we we don't the, the public gatherings of. 10 and less people is not prohibited. What is prohibited, you know, as end, it must be connected to essential service. Um, so, you know, so that's the connection. And, and you must comply with the health protocols uh, that are in place. That, that is the Understood. requirement. So, Understood. 
what you're doing in, in the privacy of your home, um, if you are six people sitting behind and painting and doing what you are doing, uh, normally it shouldn't be an issue uh, for us because it's not a public space uh, as far as I can, I can see, but I don't know whether... Okay, there's a we've got a third view. caller, uh, Hafeni from Valfas. Hafeni, can you hear me? Hello, Hafeni. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. All right, uh, sir, I'm making uh, one question and maybe one question to one. Uh, my question is that we group our country into zones, and that I want to speak to the modality of when one one travels from one point to another within the same zone. Uh, for example, if you are in zone one, um, I want to know if, if you are within zone one, you really need to have a permit for you to travel the line to the line to is again very very bad oh, okay uh, are you is a bit better can you please call us back up and we're really very sorry but we can't hear you all right sir. thank you um maybe if there are journalists that wants to join the queue please please, please feel free uh whilst they are coming i've interrupted the minister excuse me for that uh, Mr. Deng's last question was about the abrupt closure. I think you were still busy explaining yes. that. Excuse me. I, I, yes, thank you, John, uh, for that reminder. So, so I, I, I suppose as, as the government, the intention is to slowly, and as you know, we, we already started um, to say, what is it that we can um, do to open up the social and, and economic space in the country, but also, uh, so, so to answer Deng's question, which he has also answered himself, is we will not just, uh, everything will not get back to normal, as it were. Remember, we continue to be in a state of emergency for at least six months, uh, six months. And, and that those six months, I believe, will end sometime in September. So that allows us to continue opening up and also continuing to review to see uh, what are the areas of concern. Particularly, uh, we must not forget why we find ourselves in this situation. And, and does it dictate for us to, to open up and in what fashion? You want to add? Yeah. Anyway, I think the, uh, the situation is really like this, that anything that is being done now is ongoing. And we always rely on the signal on the ground based on the advice that we get from our colleagues from health to say, having looked at what is happening in terms of the containment of the, uh, the, 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 the disease, in terms of the, the, uh, the tests that they are doing on the ground, this will then advise as to whether we should relax some restrictions, whether we should introduce more health measures in place that will then help to mitigate the situation. And of course, at the end of the day, that will then inform us whether or not we need to extend the, 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 uh, the restrictions that are in place now. We need to relax some, we need to reduce some of the measures in order to mitigate the situation. That's really what, what will inform us. And again, at the, at the same time, as I say, there's also an ongoing assessment looking at the economic impact and see how best can we then also face in some of the activities you know, within that time, to be able to allow the economy to continue functioning so that it doesn't stifle the growing of the economy okay. at this stage. We've got another caller before we give over to the journalists. We've got Maria from Ondangwa that wants to pose a question to the panelists. Maria, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning to you. Uh, I would like to find out and pose a question um, in regards to the zones, the classification of of how the zones are divided can, can you into. the question again, sorry? No, I want to find out how the zones are divided into. Like, uh, since we say we are from zone 1 to zone 10, like, which one is zone 1, which one is zone 2, and which one is zone 3? If you can have the details again, the so, information so, of the zones. So basically the question is, correct me if I'm wrong, you want to find out uh, more about the regions which yes. the zones, excuse me, which, which regions constitute 
what zone, basically? Yes, that's okay. right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. John. Yes, you may. In the regions, I think the uh, Annex A actually set out what zones, what makes us of uh, which zones. If you go to, um, to Annex A, for example, it tells you exactly. We just get the. Uh, now, if you go to uh, Zone 1, for example, so Zone 1 is Zimba uh, yes, Zambezi. Zambezi. Then Zone 2 is Kavango East and Kavango West. And then Zone 3, you have Ohangwena, Oshikoto, and Oshana region. Zone 4, you have Omsati region. Zone 5, you have Ochozonjupa and Omaheke. But that will then exclude certain parts of those regions that, yeah, that form, form part of Zone 6. That's the real both. And okay. Then we have Zone 6, that's the Sokomas region, that then includes Okahanja and Riobot for obvious reasons, because those towns fit into in, in terms of economic activities. And the two tarred roads between the... Yes. That's right. Then you have Zone 7, that's Erongo. And then Zone 8, we have Karas, then Hardap, it's in Zone 9, and Zone okay. 10 is Kunene region. But I'm sure, Attorney General, those zones would be published also like announced to the people over the radios, as you've mentioned earlier, so that people know... That's correct. In fact, that, that, that those zones are part of the, uh, of the, the Gazette okay. that is published already. Yes. So I think uh, we just urge our you know, members of the public to really try to access that document. It's uh, freely available. No, but I mean uh, we but should we... use the media yes. so as to inform the people That's about correct. That's correct. That information will be shared as we go along. Yes. In fact, the security cluster has provided much more detail of the zones. Okay. Uh, that's broken down. That document could perhaps be shared. Thank you very much. We are again going to first, before we take any further questions from the general public, we are again going to allow the media practitioners to ask their questions. And I'm informed there are two mics that can be used. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ogito Gray from Republican. I've got four questions. Firstly, regarding the restrictions on alcoholic beverages, is it correct that beverages with alcohol content below 3% can now be sold? And is it only the sale of an alcoholic beverage which is prohibited, or uh, is possession or uh, any other uh, use of it also uh, possibly prohibited. Secondly, I'd like to ask about those self-starters, specifically looking at the informal traders. I know on social media I saw a picture of a gentleman from the coast who got his wheelbarrow out. He put his um, vegetables neatly in bags, he got his gloves and he has some hand sanitizer and he set off shortly after the president made his speech to commence his business. But uh, officially, we are supposed to await regulations from Ministry of uh, Urban Rural Development, which hasn't said anything yet. So do you encourage people to take the initiative and try to follow the rules and go on with their lives? Or do you think people should wait um, for the officials to come out with relevant regulations, bearing in mind how urgently people might need to put food on the table? Thirdly, I'd like to know specifically about mines. Is it now a position that the mines can ramp up production and start off uh, um, uh, uh, digging out the open pits again, or is it still a restricted production? And finally, I'd just like to know whether the decision to criminal criminalize fake news is an indication that government is more comfortable trying to restrict what people say rather than uh, confident in fighting fake news by providing information uh, that is trustworthy and uh, accessible and so timeless that there's no room for fake news, if that is well understood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The second journalist before I give over to the panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, Honorable Minister of Justice, Honorable Attorney General. Um, I'm Pancho Molongeni, representing the Namibian. I want to really ask a question to our Minister of Justice in terms of the enforcement of the provisions. And actually, in this state of emergency, <coughs> are we adopting a human rights approach? And what I mean by that is if someone, for instance, is an irregular migrant, and may have the symptoms, 
and they go forth to the Ministry of Health, are they now going to also be detained for being an irregular migrant? Similarly, we know that people don't have much income. A lot of people would, would turn to sex work during this time. Sex work doesn't stop. Will people uh, still be criminalized, especially ladies who often themselves are irregular migrants, if they uh, present to the health facilities with symptoms since they are, are very exposed? And similarly, couldn't there be an intervention to them to actually inform them of the dangers? Uh, and that's actually a question about what is our approach? Is it really punitive or is it a human rights approach as we move forward? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we take any other questions, let me first rather attend to, yeah? Uh, John, let me, let me start with the last question, which is, which is a norm uh, adopted because that's the thing that you remember first. I, I think the, the question, there is no doubt um, about the continued operation of our constitutional framework in Namibia. You would understand that uh, once a state of emergency is declared, the, the Article 24 uh, has provided us with a scope of rights that can be limited. Um, there are certain rights, and it really relates to uh, what, it, what Mr. Mulengeni is talking about, is the fact that um, when you, 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 there are certain rights that, that cannot be derogated from. Your right to dignity, your right to equality, your right to non-discrimination, even your cultural rights. Um, and I think, you know, at all material times, uh, in our interaction with the Namibian public, we try and, uh, you know, deal with, with, with our people in, in that fashion. Now, there are some challenges around um, what he terms sex workers and migrant workers and so forth. By, a, by its very nature, um, you know, a state of emergency limits the movement of people. Um, it doesn't stop people from doing what they would ordinarily do within the privacy of their space. Um, there's nothing that stops, in this instance, a sex worker from continuing to do um, his or her work at a space that would otherwise not interfere with public movement and that will not move divided from one place to the other. So that's, that's really um, the, the point that I would like to make. So, uh, like the, the Attorney General was saying earlier on, the intention has never been to be punitive. That's why we encourage Namibians to comply, because uh, I believe that as a collective we are saying we're finding ourselves in this situation. What is it that we should do? What are the things that uh, Mr. Mulangeni thinks we should do differently uh, to, to enhance and create a space uh, that is more human rights friendly without compromising on, on what it is that we want to achieve, which is the containment of the virus. So that, I think there's a, there's a huge debate uh, that from a human rights perspective that we can continue to have, but the intention is never to prejudice the Namibian society. A question that relates directly to what was asked by the last speaker was whether the criminalization of fake news mm -hmm. doesn't serve as a smokescreen by the government to, to restrict free speech of the, of the people? Absolutely not. And, and, and remember, they, there is no right that is absolute. I mm -hmm. think that's, that's something that we need to understand, even if within our constitutional paradigm. But um, the, the, I think even journalists know uh, for, there's a reason, for example, why we have a media ombudsman. Uh, there's a reason why there is an opportunity created for members of the public to complain if any action is taken that is likely to cause harm or is of a def defamatory nature. So, so the intention is never really, and I, I, I don't understand where we get this impression from, that government is always out to get people. That is not our intention. The intention is how do we ensure that we um, protect a disproportionate number of Namibians. It's not always uh, going to satisfy everyone, but the, we want to uh, create an environment where Namibians will also feel safe. This is the kind of information 
that could cause serious harm, not just to this country, but to individuals uh, of our society. For instance, the reason why we refer to case number um, as opposed to the name of a person is to protect the dignity of people, is to protect the privacy of our Namibian people. So there are so many instances and, and examples that we can show that the Namibian government has never been out to get its people. Uh, how would you answer then the question with regard to the restriction of alcohol? Does it mean um, those with uh, an alcohol volume of less than three, is it allowed? It, it, it would from, you know, um, it would seem to me from the perspective of the Liga Act that anything below that content, because we, as I said to you, we've taken this from, from the Liga, Liga Act, and I know that it, it has also created an ideological debate whether or not this is now promoting a certain ideology, capitalism versus socialism and so forth. And those are debates I think Namibians should continue to have, but we need to ask ourselves the fundamental question at the end of the day, um, what is it that the government is doing to enhance protection uh, of our people and, and the health of, of our society. There is a supreme um, uh, objective that all governments should have, and that is to ensure that the welfare and the health and the safety of its, of its society is supreme. With that answer, are you then saying that the question that was posed with regard to possession, so possession is not prohibited, so to speak? Possession is not prohibited, but I can tell you um, under the regulations, but I can tell you under the Police Act, uh, and rather under the Criminal Procedure Act, uh, under Section 40, it provides a broad scope for the police to when they find somebody with intoxicating liquor, that they can seize it if they believe that that uh, alcohol that has been found is about is suspected to be a commission of an offence. Now, what would that be in our instance? Um, the question would be: Are you have you are you potentially committing the offence of selling or per having purchased um, alcohol? Because I, I would not understand why people would be with a box of alcohol on the street that they have bought pre-lockdown on the 27th of March. I, I would not be able to understand that. And the police would have the right to believe that that is potentially committing an offence. There was also another question with regard to whether people should, and I must admit I didn't get that properly, whether people should wait for the regulations to be passed by some other it's ministries or can they go ahead and show initiative to do what they would want to do, for example, uh, starting a garden or what is that? Go to the mic, sorry, please. Uh, the example was of an informal trader who trades in vegetables. After he heard the president's speech, he got out his wheelbarrow, packaged his goods, put on gloves and got some hand sanitizer and went on the street. But the president's speech also said regulations would be determined by Ministry of Urban Rural Development, who hasn't said anything since the president's speech. I'm asking, should citizens now wait until the ministries present the um, regulations or can they take the initiative provided they act within the spirit? Yeah. Uh, Francis, would you mind? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. There are certain activities that definitely have to be regulated before they are undertaken. And, and uh, I think the best is probably to identify what is that person intend to do. For example, as we have pointed out, we got the open markets and the uh, street vendors, for example, there are certain measures that need to be put in place for those activities to take place, just to ensure that at least there are protections or measures are in place to regulate those activities. Uh, the situation that you are pointing out, I'm not too familiar whether that's somebody who's already registered with the Ministry of Trade or somebody who's probably a sole trader who's simply doing this uh, on his or her own. So we probably need to understand more. And if, should there be any questions that need to be clarified, the Ministry of Trade is engaged in identifying some of those entities that are required to register, in just to, to get a convention certificate that these are people who are engaged in, pro in the provision of uh, um, critical services and goods. So if there is any doubt whatsoever, they should then engage the Ministry of Trade just to understand what is it uh, that they, they need to do 
because I'm not too sure at this stage where they are, whether they are registered, registered already, whether they intend to do so. So therefore, those uh, information can be obtained from there. However, there could be other activities that, that may not necessarily need to wait for the minister. So I, we just need to, to be clear as to what is it that uh, you know, the, the person intend to do. So, but just to add to that, there is also a process whereby various ministries have or are in the process of coming out with directives that stipulates what exactly need to be done in terms of process that need to be followed. Uh, some of those directives are already coming out and unfortunately some of them are still on the pipeline. So we just want to urge the public to keep on checking with the relevant ministries. If you are, for example, in the agricultural sector, you check with the Ministry of Agriculture. If you are in the mining, you check with the Ministry of Mines and Energy. If you are in the, in the fishing, the same. So, so that you get the relevant information. There was a question uh, with, uh, with regard to mining. Whether, does it, does it mean, does it mean normal mining continue now? Or is it still in a restricted format? Would you mind talking about that? Yes, thank you, John. The, the issue of mining was discussed extensively. That was discussed same time with the issue of fishing. And mining initially was looked at from the basis that maybe there need to be some minimal mining just to do some maintenance work so that the main does come to a standstill. However, then there was a, some reconsiderations on the matter. Normal mining is allowed under the current regime. Okay. However, that shall be subject to health protocols that are set and they agree between the Ministry of Mines and the Ministry of, uh, of, 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 of Health. That's really just to ensure that whatever activities are taking place in the mines or those operations are subject to those health protocols. Thank you very much for that clarification. Let's take the next round of questions from the journalists. Um, good morning, TD Fred and journalists. I only have two questions, one for Mr. Mbandeka. I just wanted to know, there's been videos that have been circulating on social media where the police were kind of, there were very disturbing videos where the police were using some sort of brute force. Can you speak into the mic, please? Uh, there, there, there have been videos that have been circulating on social media of late where I think the latest one was one where the police was using brute force to pour, pour in traditional beer on, 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 on someone who was supposedly selling it. This is some sort of um, instilled fear in, in, in the public. From Mr. Mbandek, I just wanted to know what exactly do the what exactly is the police supposed to do? Let's say they get to a place where maybe people are breaching the regulations. What is the first thing that they're supposed to do? How do they communicate? And also, what are the guidelines in terms of using the most minimum force as um, as, 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 as possible? That's uh, question number one. Then to the Minister of Justice, I just wanted to clarify. There's also some sort of confusion. Let's say people are moving from one suburb to the other. For example, I'm moving from Katutura. I'm going to acquire essentials in town. I don't have a letter that then says I'm an essential service worker or whatnot. Sometimes uh, there be roadblocks. I think just recently in a, we don't know where they were sent back, right? What is the situation for those who, of course, definitely this person is coming from Katutura. Needs to, they can't find certain essential services maybe in Katutura and they need to go to town. Are those people catered for as well? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. The next one. Thank you. My name is Kevin. Once again, I present uh, for Eagle FM. These questions are coming from our listeners. I've got three questions for you. Uh, can you please ask the Minister of Health, I gather he's not here, but uh, we do have some authorities, to tell us about the two Romanians, have they recovered? And uh, the second one. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear that properly. The Romanian couple. Okay. Has the couple recovered completely? And the second question. I think this one goes to the Honorable Minister of Justice. Regulations together with the Attorney General. Regulations provide that a gathering of 10 can attend a funeral. Funerals are conducted by pastors, but pastors are not listed as essential service providers. How will that work? Secondly, is it correct to state that weddings are prohibited since no mention of them is made? Can a couple get married at a magistrate's court or by a pastor behind closed doors? And then the last one, uh, also coming from our listeners, who is the inventor of the test technology? Who is the producer? Who is the manufacturer? Is the manufacturer linked to the predicted surveillance outcome and predicted action plan? Who is the inventor? Who is the producer? 
the producer, who is the manufacturer the of the test technology? Of the test is it technology? linked to the predicted surveillance the outcome health. and predicted action plan? It's a very technical question, yeah. all coming from our listeners. Thank you. Right. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there was a mix of both um, questions with reference to the regulations as well as directed to the health sector. Um, so please stand, on by, stand, stand, stand by and then from the health people to answer some of those questions. The question of brute force, the use of brute force by the police, um, what, what must the public know and do in such cases and whether there are guidelines with regard to the use of minimum force? Um, I, I will allow the Attorney General to answer that as the advisor to government, but I think um, I want to answer, just to say there is, there is nothing uh, coming from, from the head of state and, and the leaders in the security sector that encourages the use of violence and force against any member of our public. I think that must be very clear. And then there is provision made uh, under the uh, Criminal Procedure Act, and I believe also under the relevant uh, statutes, that police must usually uh, only use force that is proportionate. So you can't use force uh, that will be greater than the thing that you want to stop. Uh, so, so I think where people, where there's been a disproportionate engagement with law enforcement, uh, members of the public have access to, uh, there is a disciplinary uh, committee at the police. I think what we will do is probably in due course share the information from the security cluster about where people can, who the people can contact and, and how they can make their complaints if they have been treated unfairly. But what we are asking people to do is when they are instructed by law enforcement to stop an action, whether it's to disperse a public gathering, we ask you to comply because there's a reason, because you are, you are actually contravening the law if you don't uh, you know, comply with a lawful instruction. I also want to just respond to the issue about essential services. I think as a general rule, uh, people, you must have some indication because now it appears to me that the burden is now on members of the public because the law enforcement has been so inundated and even in a way, I think, overwhelmed with requests and people moving up and down is we want people to be confined to their homes, but when you leave because you need to get essential goods, we are asking you to firstly do that within the confines of your neighborhood. I think most, whether it's in Komastal or in Kadutura, you would normally find. But in the event you are unable to find, my suggestion would be that you take the receipt from you know the things that you have, because you must have something that you've bought elsewhere. In Vumanbrok, for example, close to uh, uh, Koreanghap, we ask you to carry some kind of evidence or a list of your, uh, whatever it is that you need to do. You'll have to satisfy the, the authorized officer that there is need for you to go all the way from Komasdal to go and do shopping uh, in Clyde Vendu. We, we, you must understand the objective is we want to minimize movement. Okay. Attorney General, uh, two questions before we give over also to the health sector in terms of finalizing. Um, are pastors included in the number of 10 when it comes to funeral? That's one. And whether weddings are allowed or not allowed during the period of lockdown? Thank you. I think the, um, in terms of numbers, the number, as I said, the number has not changed. So therefore, if it says 10, then at any given time, at that particular occasion, you must conform to that number. I think the, the arguments about the churches and various other activities, sometimes they are very difficult to, to, uh, to probably provide for because I think there are very emotional issues attached to some of these, the same thing with cultural events. So therefore, the, the basic objective really is to minimize the so in, so in other words, pastors as the rule currently stand, 
they are included yes. in the yes. in the ten. So that, that's that's the, 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 okay. the, the what the regulation says. But quickly ten, about because they are asking me to wrap up. Uh, uh, quickly about weddings. Weddings, weddings. Basically, we, we all know that the in terms of the uh, the courts, the courts have also come up with their own procedures. What should happen during this time period? So therefore, that it appears from the look of things that uh, the directive that has been produced is to say that only urgent matters shall then take place in the courts during this. this so this wedding period. is not urgent. No, 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 John. John, okay. no, that no. is not. No. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me just let, just clarify. <laughs> it could be that in the circumstances, <laughs> if 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 the the uh, the arrangements are done in such a way that the uh, ceremony or the can be done under controlled uh, circumstances that could, could be done but i've, I've seen that uh, in, in some circumstances for example certain churches have completely said no they are not going to conduct okay. the ceremonies okay. but at court i think it could be a different processes whereby that can be arranged but that's subject to those conditions that are also... The minister wants to add Yes, quickly. the courts, courts have said for, for now we will not register marriages. But remember, marriage is not about uh, whether you're doing it at, at the courts or at the church. It's about the marriage officer. So if the marriage, the person that wants to marry you is registered as such and is qualified to do that, if you want to do that behind at, in your yard, you know, you it know, it, it just... It just makes you know, and, and it, it can still happen. Okay. We we can't control what happens behind behind closed Thank doors. Thank you very unfortunately. much. Very quickly, an update with regard to the Romanian couple. That was one of the questions that was asked from Eagle FM. Yeah, as we all know, that uh, the Romanian couples were our uh, first cases, and uh, as you have heard the update from the minister earlier on those who have recovered, these were not included as yet. Okay. They are still in isolation. We are still monitoring them. The nation will be updated when they recover. Thank you. Now, there was also another question. Who benefits from this? Is it the inventor, the producer, and the manufacturer of this uh, testing technology? I don't think, okay, would, you, would you mind answering that question or would that be an unfair question? Can I get the question again? I the question that was also asked was like, who benefits really from this whole COVID-19 thing? And so the question was, is it the inventor of the technology, the producer, the manufacturing of this testing technology? That's how I got it. <laughs> Not? <Yeah. laughs> but we are about to wrap up, man. Very quickly, okay. who is the inventor? Or who, who is, the, is inventor? the producer, the manufacturer? Are these, or is this entity linked to the predicted surveillance outcome and predicted action plan? Okay, That's the question. You got the question? <laughs> A bit beyond me, probably. <laughs> okay. I, I think that questions I need to refer it to our lab experts Expert. to be able to provide that answer yeah. probably in due course. Thank you. Yeah. Right. What we will do now, we've come to the end of this uh, broadcast, but in order to be, just to be fair, what we will do, because we had two sets of things that we wanted to address, the health update, and so we will start with them, each one, just very briefly, your last closing remarks. And then we would come then to the legal sector, Minister of Justice and the Attorney General also to very briefly give us their closing remarks and then we'll close the session. Would you mind? All three of you, very quickly. Thank you very much for the platform given to the health sector. Uh, just to remind the nation that we are still fighting for COVID-19, against COVID-19. So we need to put all our efforts together. It's a state of emergency where everyone is expected to contribute their bit in this fight. Together we can make it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm informed that unfortunately we can't take all three. Excuse me for that. Uh, and for the expectations that I've created. 
excuse me for that. Uh, Attorney General. Thank you, John. I think Namibia as a nation, we have embarked upon an exercise of, of, which is extraordinary in a sense that we are faced with a very, very serious situation. And that situation has warranted the President to invoke certain provisions of the Constitution that's to declare a state of emergency to address the situation of COVID-19. For that, certain measures are in place to regulate our conduct during that period. And this is not necessarily to make the situation more harder for people than it is, but it's simply to protect their lives and to make sure that Namibia suppress the transmission of, 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 of COVID. Then we therefore, from the legal and justice sector, we want to encourage Namibians to really take this as a, a life-saving measure, not as a law enforcement issue, so that we can protect our lives, protect our families' lives, and also to make sure that Namibia go through this period and make sure that we don't end up faced with a very, very critical situation we are not able to control. So we therefore want to encourage all Namibians to comply with their regulations and to make sure that they minimize their movements either within their surroundings or in or out of the, the, uh, their zones. And we know that this obviously have got some, imposes some limitations in some of their freedoms, but we believe that this is done with a very good intention. And we think that the conditions that are in place are fairly flexible and reasonable so that you allow them to be able to have access to the basic services and goods until such time when the restrictions are relaxed. So therefore we want to encourage all the Namibians and members of the public to cooperate with the law enforcement agencies through this period. And should there be any situation that warrants, you know, attention of the authority in terms of probably the abuse of the, uh, or evaluation of the human rights, we want to encourage those people to come forth with the information so that we can make, make sure that such kind of practice is stopped or minimized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. John. Madam Minister, excuse me. No worries. John, I just want to say we must remember whatever gathering is going to be allowed, whether it's 10 people or more, it must be for the sole objective of containing the further spread of the virus to, to control and manage uh, COVID-19. You cannot during this period have a party, for example. We will not have a situation where people use this opportunity uh, or what they think are spaces in, in the regulations to, to, to not comply uh, with what we want to achieve. So please stay at home um, when you are in the public space for those limited times, uh, please practice social distancing and avoid crowded places. It's extremely, extremely important. People must not use the benefit of the privacy of their homes to gather as friends. Homes are meant for family members and those people who live in the same area, either for rental arrangements and so forth. So Namibia, please be safe and take care of yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank at this opportunity the, all the panelists uh, that has contributed very effectively and in a very qualitative manner to educate the nation in this regard with regard to what we've discussed. So thank you so much, Yvonne. Thank you, Festus, Lily Keller, and all the others that I cannot mention by name, by way of, because we are running out of time. I would like also to say, I thank uh, the ministry, ED, for having invited me to participate and to moderate this discussion. I see this as my singular honor. And I can but just also repeat what the minister is saying here. It's like, uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, let us stay safe, wash our hands, and practice social distancing. Thank you very much. And as they say in Oshihero, Okuhepa. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. What an informative session here at the National COVID Communication Center. We heard from the Minister of Justice, Yvonne Dausip, and the Attorney General, Mr. Festus Mbandeka, as well as an update from the Minister of Health, Shalumbi. He told us that there are still zero deaths due to COVID-19 in Namibia, and even better news, we've had six recoveries to date. Another piece of very good news is that targeted mass testing will kick off as of this coming week, with the target being 200,000 Namibians to be tested. Further, we also learned that uh, there's been restriction to, uh, I mean, relaxation of the restrictions, which is very good news, especially for informal traders who are encouraged to uh, keep themselves informed as to any pronouncements from Ministry of Urban and Rural Development and Ministry of Trade as to how they can go about their businesses. Also very good news for the country's economy that uh, the mining operations can ramp up production again. And finally, for the rest of us, alcohol under 3% can now be sold. So I wish you all the best. Stay safe, stay home, stay informed. Good luck, Namibia, from all of us here at the COVID Communications Center, especially the NMH team. We wish you all the best and have a very nice weekend. My name is Ogito Greg. Thank you. Goodbye. Last night on national, radio, on national television, 8 o'clock news, uh, Commissioner Shikongo actually lamented the fact uh, that, according to him, uh, they can't do anything. Before we speak here, that will be case number three, case number five, case number six. Before we speak here, that will be case number three, case number five, Case number six, case number 14, case number 15, and case number 16. All of these four cases have now fully recovered uh, from uh, COVID-19. Some of them have already been announced before, but I'm just giving you now the totality of the picture. Number two, we are going to carry out targeted testing. As I have uh, informed you earlier, targeted testing, um, we are looking at different type of cohorts. Um, this will include the health workers, um, people who are working in the fishing factories, in the fishing sector, in the mining sector. This will also include the journalists. Uh, so by next week, uh, we will um, try to get everybody who is also at this center will also be uh, tested. The test is very simple. It's non-invasive. It's just a swab which is taken from an individual. You will not feel anything, so don't fear anything. It's, it's harmless, and in actual fact, it is also pleasant to undergo such a, a swabbing. We will again um, identify more and more a group of people who will be uh, tested, and uh, our target is to get more than 200,000 people tested uh, in Namibia for uh, COVID-19. This will also include the categories I have mentioned earlier in the past, like those who have been in contact, those who are presenting to the health facility with respiratory ailment, etc., etc. So this is now one of the undertakings which we are going to carry out as from next week. We are now doing the preparations. Uh, dear moderator, I think uh, after I have made this announcement, I will take leave because I just came from another engagement. 
but the team from the Ministry of Health and Social Services, they are here, they remain here, and they will be able to answer the question should there be any additional question arising. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Minister. Maybe I must also just clarify that...